So we're in a series right now called When Life Hands You Lemons. And it is about uh, dealing with disappointments, um, but also setting godly expectations is the hope of that. And uh, we went through it last week talking about expectations. We went through it talking about what it means that expectations actually come from a place of hope. That when you have expectations on someone, what you mean is, I hope you can meet this level. And we talked about it in the life of families. And so we said, how many of you have expectations of your loved ones? Do we have expectations of our loved ones out there? Yes, some of you. Okay, that's great. Um, how many of your loved ones have failed maybe one time? One time in the life of being together in meeting those expectations. <laughs> As the, okay, all of you laughed like every day. <laughs> like, let's be clear. Expectations, though, have been associated with disappointment. And so we broke that down last week, talking about the expectations. No, they need to be nested in hope. What you're telling someone when you set expectations is, I believe that you can be here, right? Uh, there's a great Tom Cruise movie where it goes, with me, without me, with me, without me, like that. And so I believe expectations increase our hope in one another, that with each other, we can become great as God hopes us to be and who God created us to be. And so those expectations are nested in a reality of hope. But I wanted to talk today about expectations of the church and really what is a recipe for hope. If we're talking about making lemons and lemonade and all that good stuff, I, I want to talk about a recipe for hope. And I think in order to do that, I wanted to start with the expectations that I had for church at the beginning. Would you guys take a little journey with me? Can we go back on a little journey just to the beginning of the church? You guys okay with that? You guys okay with that? I'm going to take you back to day one. Day one of the church, we were in an elementary school. We set up in an elementary school. We set up 150 chairs in the elementary school. 149 people showed up. It was awesome. It was all the people from the other churches in the area, though, that wanted to come out with a new thing. They wanted to check it out. What's this new thing going on? What's happening? And so they all came in to check this out, and it went wonderful. Uh, I was so nerve-wracked, though, that I walked around the whole worship with keys in my pocket, hanging out of my pocket because I forgot to take my keys out, forgot to take everything else out. I just ran up right before worship. The projector fell over, which is a disaster in worship, like it, just not knowing what to do. I had all these expectations that would happen with worship, and it went wonderful. So the next week, in the life of our story, I called the newspaper. And I'm like, you don't even know what's happening in the northwest Arkansas. The neighborhood church is coming. We're here. God has moved us. It's incredible. I called the paper. like, oh, what time is your service? And I said, 10, 10. 10, 10 is our service time. Come on out. So we set up for 180 chairs. Can I give it up for that? Right? That's, that's a good increase. We had aisles. We put, aisles was a big thing. I don't know why, but we had aisles. It was incredible. And we set up runner. And I went back before service and I prayed. I went back before service and I prayed and I said, hey, God, just call my heart. God, I want you to be present in this worship. I want you to send the spirit over the people that are here. I want us to gather together. I want to grow this church in northwest Arkansas. And as I was getting ready, it was about two or three minutes before service. And I knew it. Like, hey, Joe, the paper's here. And I'm like, okay, great. So I was coming out to meet the paper. And I walked out to 180 chairs and 23 people, <laughs> some of which were the band. <laughs> and I can't. Expectations. I expected that next service to be 180, 200 people. We don't have enough chairs. And all of a sudden, it was 23 people. 23 people in the church, and there they were. And so I was like, ah, what are the expectations as we go back in? And so I wanted to start us on a, a recipe for hope, a recipe in our expectations. Because the next time we had a first worship was at our new building. And I remember the night before, we hadn't finished all the construction. Who needs a certificate of occupancy, <laughs> right? And we did a... Is there any building people here from the city of Benton? <laughs> no? Okay. We totally had a certificate of occupancy if Benville's watching. Okay, here we go. We did a walkthrough of the church on a Sunday, and everyone showed up. It was kind of crazy. And so, but when we walked through, I remember we were trying to get everything ready, and it wasn't ready. That worship wall that you see over there is our first worship wall. We didn't have it finished, so all you saw behind it was studs. That was it, and a cross area, and it wasn't done, and the outlets had no covers, and we didn't realize it until we got into worship, and we're like, oh my gosh, so we blue taped all the outlets around the hole. We had zero carpet, the acoustics were horrible, and guess what we did? We worshiped. We worshiped, and we praised God, and it was incredible, and we gathered. Do you know why? It's because it's never been about the church. It's never been about the physical location. It's always been about the body of Christ. Yeah. It's always been about the body of Christ. And the expectation that the church built was that you would put your faith into the church. 
not into the body of Christ. And so what we started changing over the years, and I was like, oh, and we went to construct this building. In a really godly way, this property came in. A person called us and said, hey, you called us a while back on this property. And I said, yeah. And we were like four or five years into the church now. I said, yeah, we're looking for property. And, said, and I said, um, and I had to save the number. And I was like, yeah, we'd love to look at your property again. They're like, well, I told you before that it wasn't available, but now it is. And we had just stopped the day before and said, there's no property. We're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And this person called and they said, where, um, I said, what? I'd love to come look. Where is it again? And they're like, oh, we're the horse barn on I Street? And I was like, oh, I got you. I know exactly who you are. And I was like, great, we'll come over. And that's how we landed here on this property in an incredible way. And I still remember the first day out on this property when we broke ground here for this building that you're in now. And we broke ground, and there was a horse arena and a stable and a milking shed and a lean-to, and there was a house, and there was a garage, and there was tires in the middle. And what did we do? We worshiped because it's about the body of Christ. What are your expectations and recipe for hope in your life? If you're placing your expectations in anything other than a godly relationship with the people around you, you might get disappointed. Because what God saw in us is that even though you're broken, even though you don't get it right all the time, even though your life is not perfect, I have hope in you and faith in you is what God said. Is that I believe in you and I believe in the redemption of my people. I believe in the forgiveness of my people, and I will sacrifice my son to see that a reality in your life. And here we are, and what do we do? We place our expectations not in that kind of relationship, in a different relationship. So I want to ask you, if you were to build a recipe for hope, what would go into your recipe for hope? And you can talk this one out. What would go into your recipe for hope? What ingredients make up hope? Faith, that's a good one. Trust, that's a great one. What's some others? Prayer. I heard you say braille, and then I heard prayer. Okay, so I'm just going to re-rack that. I was like, braille's interesting. I was like, that could, that could be hopeful. Like, I want to read a book. You know, like, it's going to be good. Uh, I got that, prayer. Okay, great. What are some other ones? Believe. Belief, goodness. See, I like this now. Come on, what goes into hope? Patience. Patience. Ooh, man, that's my wife. <laughs> I don't know why she's saying that. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> what else do we got? Optimism. Optimism? Forgiveness. Forget, ooh, forgiveness. Plan. Perseverance. Communication. Love. A positive attitude. Love. <coughs> when you look at the relationships that you have in this life, is that how you look at them? Every single day? Is that the reality of the expectations of your actions with the people around you? Not their actions towards you. That's not how God came into this world through Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus Christ to say, hey, I'm acting on behalf of you. I'm sending someone so you see what it is to walk this world with the ministry and a heart of God. And you can witness that, what it means to die for the sake of someone else because you love them unconditionally, without distinction. How many of you look at the relationships in your life like that? See, here's what I believe. Yes, we're building a preschool, and we're building a youth building. We've got an amphitheater, basketball courts. It's incredible. But we're going to change lives Mm -hmm. with an expectation that God is moving (coughs) in northwest Arkansas that is bigger than any single one of us. Because when I planted this church, I never knew it would become this. When I planted this church along with those 23 faithful people, when we had two young ones that were eight, like two and zero at the time, right? We didn't expect that God would do something like this. It's bigger than we asked or imagined in our life, which means that God is calling us to something greater, not just a building. God's calling us to relationship. God's calling us to have an expectation of godly hope in the families we're going to meet and the lives that we're going to change. And so I want to walk you through a recipe of what I have for hope. And we're going to open scripture to do that. So if you got the Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians. If you got a Bible, raise up the Bible. We love Bibles in the church. If you got a Bible, raise it up. We have a mission that everyone will bring a Bible to church. I love it. we got some good books around there. Yes, I love it. Great. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, we got a Bible boxes around our church. 
They have Bibles all in them. And if you go look in those boxes, you can grab a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you can take it with you. Uh, we would love for you to take the Bible, take it home, study it. We would love that. If you don't have a Bible, we're on the Bible app. So who's got the Bible app? Raise it up there. Got smartphones. Great. I love it. Everyone's connected these days. So if you go into the Bible app, you can scan the QR code that's on our church apps card behind here. If you're online with us, there's a Bible app link up above in the description, and you can go check on that. We're going to be in Ephesians, and uh, this is in the New Testament. And Paul is writing a letter to the church at Ephesus, and he is writing a letter about hope at this point. And so we're going to be in uh, chapter 3, reading verses 14 through 19 to start. And each part of this recipe, <coughs> we're going to read a little bit more for a recipe of hope. And here's what it says, chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. And this is a prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Holy Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in what? Love, which we said was an expectation of hope. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height <coughs> and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness, all the fullness, of God. Now I want to go back for a second into verse 16 and 17. I want you to listen to this. I pray, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. See, this recipe that's going on is very important. This recipe is about rooting and grounding you in love, but it's also a part where the recipe is something that God is saying it's through his spirit, through the work of God while you are being rooted and grounded in love, aka you have an action taking place and God is dwelling where? In your heart. Already, God is with you. But this is happening through God. And so the first thing I like about this recipe is how many um, of you have a recipe from a family member, like maybe a grandma or a grandpa that's been passed down that you make maybe like Thanksgiving or you make at Christmas or how many of you have those out there? Do we have some people out there? Okay, great. Um, that's wonderful. How many of you um, claim that as like a family recipe now, right? Do you, do you have that? How many of you claim it as your own recipe and haven't told anyone it's actually from someone else? Okay, some of you have done that. That's good. Okay. Here's one of the first thing I want to say about a recipe for hope. The recipe is not yours. Hope was given from God. Hope comes from God. You are not the dealer of hope. God gave that to us in Jesus Christ. And the beginning of this means that if the recipe is not from you, it's from your family. And it's for the family. It's for the body of Christ. See, we can't take this identity of hope on ourselves because we need a hope that is greater than us. We need a hope that we cannot comprehend. It says we need knowledge greater than we can comprehend, which means this hope is greater than we can comprehend. It is God's. So the first thing that we do is we give it back to God and say it's not ours to begin with. That we literally walk with a message of the hope that who brings? God brings. If I walked into someone's life and said, today I bring you hope, they'd be like, what? <laughs> I'm like, no, God brings you hope. Every single day, God brings the hope into our life. And listen to how this continues. I want you to turn over, and I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. So we're going to go back just a little bit, and 8 through 10. And this is a great verse that literally forms our theology as a church. And listen to what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not what? Your own doing. It is the gift of who? God. God. <laughs> we could listen to that all day. For by God's grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. It is not ours, it is God. It is not a result of our works so that we may not boast. We may build for God, but it is not ours. We may grow for God, but God gives that growth. We may meet families, and God gives them hope. But we bring the message of that hope. It's completely different when we're forming this recipe. The great part about this is I want you to turn now to Hebrews 11.1. 1. And Hebrews 11.1 1 is a little bit farther in your scripture in the New Testament. Because what I heard in this message was that for by grace you have been saved through faith. And I think that we need to understand what faith is. Because I believe that a part of the recipe is this desire that we would have faith, but not to our own fullness, but to the fullness of God. And listen what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. How many of you live in hope? Just by a show of hands. If you didn't raise your hand, if you raise your hand like halfway, there's like, it's like 50% hope. <laughs> like, I'm hopeful most days. <laughs> like, I'm talking about how many of you live and that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Not some days. It's the conviction of things not seen, that I don't need physical evidence of it. I live in a hope that is greater than me. How many of you live in that hope? Okay. There's like 20% out of you that are out there that live into this hope. I call myself an eternal hopist. It's what I call myself. Like, you cannot steal this joy. I'm telling you right now. It is eternal. Like, it's just going to go. And I kid you not, I can take any situation and be like, but we could. <laughs> you think there's nothing that we can do here, but if we can try this, we might have this level of hope that goes into us. See, what I believe here is that a recipe for faith says it's not your own to start with, but the first part of that recipe is a measure of faith. It's for by grace you have been saved through faith. And so that measure of faith goes into the recipe for hope, but it's how much you bring into that recipe, and it's different for every single person. See, my cup overfloweth with hope. Some of you that raise your hand part ways, you're a half a cup. <laughs> half a cup of hope. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, that might be the part of the recipe that you need to work on. That might be the part of your relationship with God that needs to be strengthened. That might be the part where we heard the word trust shouted out and we thought of the people next to us and we may be thinking about our relationship with God. If we trust what God is doing and we trust who God is in our life, then maybe that, that measure of faith increases a little bit. Maybe that measure of faith in your life grows a little bit. It becomes something that brings a little element of hope. And here's the great part. As we continue this, what are you hoping for? Like as I say, what do you hope for right now? many different things come up in our mind? Did God come up? New job? New career? More time with family? Vacation? Rest? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Patience? <laughs> what do you hope for? When I ask that question, did you hope for a deeper relationship with God? Because remember, we started talking about that this all begins with your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to break you of is that you're placing your hope in people and things on this earth. You're placing a hope in a foundation that can walk away. You're placing your hope in a foundation that can be washed away. You're placing your hope in a foundation that is not the rock that Christ said that we're going to build the church on. You're placing your hope in a foundation that is not God. That's why we're building this recipe. So let's go on. We're going to be in Ephesians. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. And we're in verses 20 through 21. And here's what it says. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. 
Amen. What a wonderful end to a prayer. You know what captured me on this verse? And I've read it so many times that I've never stopped on it. Listen to the beginning. Now to him by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. I just want to think about that for one second. It's abundantly and far more than we could ask or imagine. I want you to think of whatever you could ask for or whatever you could imagine and then think of abundantly and far more. How many of you bought a Powerball ticket? You thought of abundantly and far more than you could ask or imagine. Am I right? I love the threshold. People are like, 20 million? No. A billion, though? I'm in. That I could use. What? Play it 20 million. I don't get it. What are you going to do with a billion dollars? If you do win, though, we are building two new facilities. <laughs> It's going to change lives. Abundantly far more. Listen to that language. Do you see what hope is in life? It's abundantly far more than we could ask or imagine. That's the part of the recipe that's prayer. Prayer needs to happen. You see how it's forever and ever, amen? Did you see the end of that? Every one of your prayers should say, Lord, I've asked you for this tonight. I've imagined that I could be in this place that you created for greater things than you have before called to your name, Lord. But I know that you will give abundantly far more than I've ever asked for or imagined. And in these things, I pray to you forever and ever and amen. And what will God do then? And at this point, I want to, I want to tell you two stories. When we were going through our campaign leading up to this, this building project actually started four and a half years ago. It started in 2018. 2019, and we are ready to pull the trigger on two new buildings right at the start of 2020. Building up and ramping up. This has been a hope and a prayer of more than we could ever ask or imagine. And when we went into it, it was a kid's city building, and we were going to do a preschool. Do you hear the difference now? Mm -hmm. Now it's a preschool, and guess what, kids? You have a building that you can use on Sundays. Mm -hmm. See, God was moving in our hearts, and we needed a season to understand something different. And as we were meeting as a campaign team to launch a campaign earlier this year, we are meeting at 9 o'clock at night. And at 9 o'clock at night, I was talking with someone who's talking about, hey, what this campaign means to them, how they're going to give. They are emotional. And I'm with them, and someone taps me on the shoulder and said, hey, there's someone here to talk about registering for the preschool. And I said, you're hilarious. We have nothing out for the preschool. Like, it's 9.30 at night. I'm talking. I didn't even look at them. I said, I'm talking to someone. Just give me a second. And they said, tap me again. And I said, you know, this person is emotional. They're, they're tears. And I don't want to look away from them because I thought that would be disrespectful. And they tapped me again and they said, hey, someone's here to talk about the preschool. <laughs> it's 9.39 on a Tuesday. On a random Tuesday. And I turn around and I go, this seriously, it's funny. And I look and there's someone standing there to talk about the preschool. And what this person came and said was something I had never thought about. And this is where prayer comes that it's ever more than we could ask or imagine. I love to say that I think through everything. I love, I, I'll think about every scenario. Every possible route, and I will go through everyone else. And when I know God is working is when something comes to me that it's like, oh, never would have thought of that. I never, ever would have got there. And I honor God every time that happens. This was an honor God moment. What happened was this person looked at me and they said, hey, I'm looking to register my child for a preschool. Do you have a preschool? <laughs> I said, we are meeting about the preschool right now. And he said, great. And he said, yeah, we're looking for spots and everything else. And I said, yeah, I know there's a lack of spots. He goes, no, 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 that's not why my child needs a preschool. And I said, what? And he goes, no, that's not the reason. He goes, uh, my child was born during COVID. So all they've known is our home and our family. They've never socially interacted with a community before. And so we need our child to be in a place where they'll meet other children and just be there with other children for social things, to just experience life. Never. You know what God is asking us to do? Abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. We are providing community for families and the children of families. And when we started there, this last night, <clears throat> just this week, we had the campaign team gathered again. 10 o'clock at night, 9.17 actually, to be exact. And we're meeting at Brian O'Patry's house. 
and we have our enjoy person in from out of town, and we're talking through all the campaign, all things in the groundbreak and everything that's happening. And as we're talking, um, I had to go to my email to get an image that we're going to put up on the screen. And on the email on the top of it, I had built out the preschool website for today. I built it out. We have a preschool website up. It's incredible, right? You have registration on there. You can kind of say, hey, I want to know more info. There's newsletters, all the information about the schools and the 120 children that we can have, and infant, full day care, all the way through five years old. It's great. It's awesome. You see all the pictures and everything. And I open my email at 917, again with the campaign team. I open my email. It says, your list has one new subscriber. And I was like, I don't get emails for that. And I was like, I've only created one list in the last couple of days. Preschool. Registration, preschool, preview. I want to know more info about the preschool. And I looked up, and at 9.17 p.m., on a day we're meeting with the campaign, the people are gathered talking about the preschool. Someone signed up to say, I want to know more about the preschool. We don't even have any information out there. <laughs> like, it's like, great, i got to make the map. <laughs> you know, i got to see what's going on. I have no idea what the next step is. Where's our communications person? Right? Ah! Right? We have this going on. And so... I see God moving in this prayer. Now follow me here. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. This is the gospel of Matthew. And these verses, I think, are a great way to end our message today as we prepare for the groundbreaking as a recipe for prayer. And here's what it says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was its fault. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them one as having authority and not as their scribes. <clears throat> if we have faith in prayer as a recipe, I think the last part of a recipe for hope is listening to God and taking action on what you hear God say. And you only do that when you are glimpsing hope. Because it's abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. What we are building and what's coming for these families is abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And we are placing our faith and our hope in God. And with that, I want to share with you something that happened that's abundantly far more than we could imagine. We were meeting here with the team talking about the property and we are meeting here with beer and hymns. And someone with the Beard and Hymns board looked at me and said, you're building a preschool. And I told them all things that are going on. I said, yeah, we're building a preschool. And they said, hey, if you come talk to me, I work for the Arkansas Community Foundation, a philanthropic organization that kind of helps people decide where their funds go. And they said, we're looking for a Bentonville preschool in order to try out and test some new models for teachers. Things like insurance and wage gaps and insecurities and making sure they can continue to grow in those things. And I said, I would love to talk about that. And they said, but we're also looking for places to serve infants and toddlers. And at that time, we weren't serving infants and toddlers. We had three, fours, and fives. And they said, but we know there's gaps. And they said, but no one's willing to serve the gap. No one's willing to serve the need. So we met with them as a church. And I went down and met with them and we reviewed the studies and where the gaps were. And we redesigned our whole preschool. We added two to three more classrooms that now have infants and toddlers. And so we have 36 spaces for infants and toddlers now. We added more teachers to drop our ratio from 1 to 15 and 1 to 18 down to 1 to 10 and 1 to 9. And we kept on growing and adding these different things and talking with them. And I said, but look, I said, uh, one thing we can't do is add a huge commercial kitchen in our building. And I said, that, that's, that's too much going on. And I said, but, you know, our team got together and we got kind of creative. And I said, what if the commercial kitchen was mobile? And they said, what? And I said, what if it acted like a catering kitchen and we built a food trailer and a truck? And we parked it outside the Kid City building, but then we could take it for mission for kids that are impoverished and don't have food. And we could take it out there and do neighbor nights and partner with For the Love off A Street. And I said, I said, would that be something that you know you could look at because we need to provide food now that we're doing infants and different things like that? And they said, Oh, that's interesting. And I said, Did you ever read the scripture abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine? <laughs> And so we kept on meeting, and they came, and we had people that started the new school in Fayetteville that are on their board. They came down, and they reviewed every 
every detail on our cash flow analysis and what's happening with the preschool and the spaces. And they helped us get all of our ratios down. They said, we want more teachers. So we added two teachers in every classroom. We said, we can do this because we're reaching families. And even though it's abundantly far more, we believe we can do greater things. And so we were waiting to hear word back. And last, this Monday, actually, not last Monday, this Monday, they called me on the phone. And they said, Pastor Joe, I usually like to say these things on Friday. Now, anyone who says something on Friday is usually looking for, like, I don't want to talk to you on the weekend. And I was like, ooh. And they said, hey, we met. We met with our person who's funding this, who's looking for that center in Bentonville, who's hoping that they can add, that we can do insurance and talk about teacher retainage, that we can do programs with you. And they said, we're hoping that if we do partner with you, that the neighborhood would not only impact those 100 families that you can serve with 120 kids, but that you can set something that we can take to other cities and show people what it means to have excellent early childhood education. They said, so I just wanted to tell you at the start of your week that we're awarding you $475,000 for the preschool so that you can continue to build and raise up teachers and salaries and everything else. Come on now. Because it's not for us. And that never happened because of something I created. God did that. So in a little bit of excitement of today, and a little bit of recipe of faith, prayer, listening, and action, right? What we did is we said, you know what? What if we did have a trailer that reached kids in impoverished? And so I would like to show you, if you guys want to see it, a maybe a little mock-up of a food trailer for the neighborhood church. What do you guys think about this? You guys want to see something? All right, stop. Show what we're looking at right here. What do you guys think? Isn't that nice? That's nice, right? It's real nice. It's so, yeah, afraid we're partnering with Ford Love. It's going to be absolutely incredible. What can God do if we ask or imagine? And our hope is based on God. God will do abundantly far more. So here's what I ask of you. Place your hope not in those around you. Place your hope in God that the spirit of God may dwell in their hearts around you and may dwell in your heart as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And then we will truly know what it means to have hope. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly gracious Father, we come before you today knowing that you are doing a new thing at the neighborhood church. Lord, it's more than we could ever ask or imagine. So we submit to your will. We submit to what you are doing. We know that you are moving us and growing us. We know that at times we are going to reach families that we have not even met yet. But our hope, Lord, is that this church will impact them with love and grace and truth and care for them. But Lord, here's my hope today. My hope is in you working into every single person's heart that is in this room, that is watching online. Every single heart that you may dwell in their heart and you may send them with the spirit of action. You may send them with the spirit of that moves into those relationships around them to see a hope that is not of this world, that is of you. So Lord, be with us this day. Send your spirit like you did over the waters in creation as you saw a dark and formless and void and created life and do that with the neighborhood church today. Transform us as a body of Christ. We are here to faithfully serve you. We are here to live in hope. It is in these things that we pray. In your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys enjoying the series so far?